I'm um, Lorraine Smith, known to most of the internet as Laurie, um, and I, I'm here to talk about bras because I know a surprising amount about bras. I think the thing I find most fascinating is the fact that um, there's such a unique garment. Well, they've got to be supportive, they've got to fit very, very well. Um, obviously, you'd quite like one that's designed very nicely as well. They've got to give you a good silhouette. Um, the sort of considerations that you don't really have for any other garment. Um, so they're very, very complicated to make, um, which is why they're expensive. So don't complain if you think a bra costs too much. They cost a lot of time and effort and money to develop. Corsets were, during Victorian times, um, overbust. Um, so they gave you um, support for your breasts um, as well as that hourglass shape. But then um, at the, the turn of the, the 20th century, corsets changed in fashion and style and they, what I always like to say, they kind of moved down the body a bit. So of course that leaves nothing much here, nothing in the way of support. And of course a lot of, um, you might have seen from pictures that a lot of Edwardian blouses were quite sheer. Um, so you might want something to kind of cover up a little bit of modesty there. So people started to develop things that they called bust supporters. Um, so they would sort of come down to about here, great big thick shoulder straps, quite often have lacing at the back. And then they, they slowly evolved um, into what became the bra. Um, the, the name brazier came around um, at the start of the 20th century. Um, and then obviously once fashions changed in the 1920s, um, this kind of um, great word I like, the, the monobosom look, because that's what the bus supporters were all about. They didn't really have any, any separation. It was all just kind of one, your, your bust was one thing, not two separate boobs. Obviously when you get into the 1920s, um, and a lot of the, the fashions were very, very kind of streamlined. And so a kind of flattening look um, was what was needed to go under, to create the, the line you would want under those clothes. Um, so obviously you wouldn't want um, a big bulky bus supporter, just something um, quite lightweight in comparison would be needed. So the, um, the brassiere developed into something um, a bit smaller and lighter the bandeau became popular so like no shoulder straps or anything they started to make them out of things like um, rayon which is another word for viscose when it was first developed it was um, an alternative to silk because um, they could create a silk like look out of it but it was a lot easier to care for a lot easier to wash um, and a lot less expensive so that meant that women could get really really pretty undergarments when they might not have been able to afford to have a big wardrobe of, of exciting under things before then. Women were um, quite often making their own bras at that time, but um, if you did buy a bra um, from a corsetry department is where you would get it from. So um, yeah, the sort of place where you would get fitted for um, corsets and girdles um, you'd get a, a bra from there and um, because the sizing was only uh, measured in inches sort of round here um, and there were no cup sizes you basically bought something and then it would be um, altered to fit you and usually they could do that in the um, corsetry department of your local department store and when we got to the end of the 1930s um, because of the change in fashions, you started to get, rather than this kind of flattened look, um, you started to get two separate cups. And this is when you get to the start of the 1930s, that's where the first, um, first company started to shorten the, the word brassiere to bra. That's when bras pretty much start to look like bras do now, with two separate cups and um, they had, um, hook and eye fastenings by that point. I mean, they, they did that in the 1920s, but they were quite often, you would get ones with hooks and eyes down the front or down the side, um, but they had moved that to the center back by the 1930s. And you were getting a little bit of stretch in then as well. So a lot of the, the 1920s bras wouldn't have really had stretch unless you were very fancy. In, in the United States, in the 1930s, there were a lot of developments um, in the sort of middle and end of the decade. 
um, companies started developing uh, cup sizing, which it does seem is baffling that nobody thought of it before then, because um, obviously if you've just got one measurement, there's, there's a lot of difference that can happen around here. But that didn't really make it to the UK until after the Second World War. Um, same with underwiring. You can find quite a lot of really interesting underwire bras from the 1930s in museums, um, but it's not really something that um, pe women in the UK would have had, and it's not really something that would have been available to most women in the US, I don't think. I, I think it would have been if you had a lot of money. The end of the 1930s, when the, um, the Second World War started, um, the things like metal were being um, saved for the war effort, and so basically companies had to cut down quite a lot. So, you know, if you were good, if you were going to have a little bit of metal, you'd probably put a couple of bones in your girdles that would normally have like six bones in them, and then just not bother with underwiring on your bras. So, a lot of bras were developed in the 1940s um, that had, uh, rather than the wiring giving you support. Um, they developed different stitching techniques on the cups. The bullet bra is very synonymous of the um, the 1950s, but it did it's that shape sort of started in the 40s. 40s aren't really all that interesting because obviously there was other stuff going on, so not so much being developed. We did get um, there was nylon, obviously had had um, been developed right before the war. Um, but then that was also conserved for the war effort, so we had to wait a little bit for that too. So when it came to the 1950s, um, bra manufacturers went a little bit crazy and they tried everything. It's like all the nylon bras, which was, it might, it might not seem glamorous now, but it was super exciting at the time because it was really new. They were used to spending like a whole day doing laundry. Everything took so long to wash and clean and dry. Um, whereas nylon, you could basically just um, swirl it around in some soap suds, um, quick rinse, hang it up to dry, and it would drip dry really quickly. And this was an absolute miracle. Um, so yeah, having your bras made out of that, especially in the summer when it's warm and you want to wash them more often, um, was a lot nicer than some of the other fabrics that had been used up until then. And then obviously the wiring started coming back. Um, in Britain we started to get the lettered cup sizing. They tried so many different things that um, one of the things was um, padding became quite popular. Obviously women had padded their breasts for years before that, centuries before that, um, but it became super popular in the 1950s because um, the hourglass shape was so desirable. There were loads of options for padding, um, including padding that was built into bras, um, and also removable pads, uh, but the best name I've seen for some breast pads from the 1950s and the Museum of FIT that are called Gay Deceivers, which I thought was quite, quite amazing. Like, I've seen quite a few 50s bras that have um, not just underwiring, but they also have boning in them as well. So to, um, and they, they would, um, long line ones would come all the way down to your waist and sometimes even further so they'd look a bit like a corset. There was overwiring as well. I mean, it didn't provide any support, obviously, because it went over the top. But um, overwiring meant that um, strapless bras, um, if you were wearing your lovely um, strapless evening gown and you leant forward, if your dress gaped, your bra wouldn't, so no one would get a peek down the top. Um, and it also looked really, really pretty as well. So moving into the 1960s, by that point, um, this very kind of structured shape of bras that we'd had in the 1950s um, was still a thing, even though we think of the 60s as being quite kind of free and easy, but that wasn't until the later part of the decade. So at the start, everything was still quite, quite structured, quite firm. However, um, by this point we had Lycra, um, and Lycra was amazing potentially even more amazing than nylon when it comes to um, bras and underwear because that meant you could have um, comfort as well as control. One of my favourite things about um, adverts from the 1960s for bras that had lycra in um, was that because up until that point you could get adjustable straps but you couldn't really get stretch straps. They'd maybe put a little bit of elastic where the strap joined the bra and so because women would, would not have been used to stretch bra straps. 
they would illustrate this in the adverts by the model sticking their thumb under the bra strap and then showing it stretching. It's just so, it seems so weird now because all bra straps are stretchy, all backs of bras are stretchy. It seems odd that there was a time when that wasn't a thing, but there were also a lot of um, other technological developments that meant that um, printing really bright, bold patterns onto nylon became um, a lot easier to do and they were able to make it colour fast. So you could get really lovely, bright coloured floral matching sets. One important thing about the bra in the 60s um, was that women didn't burn them. Um, I, I looked into this when someone asked me. Um, there were some protesters who were planning to go to Miss America pageant in 1968 and um, their plan was that they were going to have um, a trash can, which they labelled a freedom trash can, and they were going to throw items into it that they considered to be um, oppressive to women. And the plan was that they were going to burn it. Um, and before this ever happened, um, somebody in the New York Times reported on that and described this bra burning horror. Um, but it turned out that they didn't actually burn it because the boardwalk that they were on was made of wood and feminists respect fire regulations so they did not set fire to their freedom trash can they just threw stuff into it um, so yeah the whole bra burning thing came about from um, a journalist who was writing about a thing that they didn't even go to i think may maybe some people did it after reading about it i don't know but the initial thing didn't happen as reported so yeah once the um the sort of the no bra look became popular obviously not every woman was happy going without a bra. Um, so bra companies um, were doing quite well um, selling bras that um, had a bit of a look that once you got your clothes over the top looked like you maybe weren't wearing a bra. A designer called Rudy Gernrich, he came up with what he called the no bra and then everybody started copying that basically. So once we get into the 1970s, um, that was, was becoming the norm. Very exciting development towards the end of the 1970s um, was the, the first sports bra, um, which was um, developed in um, 1977 in the US by a couple of women who were fed up of going running and just not having enough support, really. Um, and one of them had been a little bit frustrated that men had jock straps for doing um, exercise and that gave a lot of support but women didn't have anything like that so um, she had a brainwave and um, using two jock straps um, managed to fashion a prototype jog bra um, so the waistband of the jock strap became the um, underband of the bra and the um, the cup section obviously became one cup and then she took that off the second one to make a second cup. Um, so yeah, the first ever sports bra was made out of men's underwear, which I find quite entertaining. Um, but yeah, this prototype was so successful, they started manufacturing those and yeah, it was a massive success. So once you got into the 1980s and everyone was going to exercise classes and um, yeah, women getting more and more involved in sport, um, then they had the support they needed, which was fantastic. Um, sadly, at this point, um, the, the biggest bra size I ever saw on an advert for bras in the 1970s um, was double D. As we get into the 1980s, I think mostly what it became about was um, companies trying to sell women lots of different bras. Why don't you have a bra for sports, a bra for evening wear, a bra for day wear? You could have ones that are slightly more low cut, some ones that are a bit more supportive. They tried to sell women a wardrobe of different bras. As we go into the 1990s, um, the really big thing that happened there, um, it was more about marketing than anything else, which I didn't realize at the time. The whole um, bra wars, as they became called, um, basically at the start of the, the 1990s, um, outerwear fashions um, started becoming a lot more low cut. So you've got some really, really plunging necklines going on. And the Wonder Bra, which had been made since the 1960s and was made um, in the UK under license by Gossard, um, that started to sell really, really well. I think it was when Kate Moss said um, that even she got cleavage wearing one. 
then it was just like everyone desperately wanted one of these. However, um, it turned out that Gossard's license to produce them um, actually expired in 1994. So the, the company that by this point owned um, the name Wonder Bra, um, also that, that company owned Playtex, which is a bra manufacturer. So they thought, hang on a minute, this is doing really well. I don't think we're going to renew the license agreement. We're going to keep Wonder Bra for ourselves. So Gossard, losing their most popular item, um, just decided that they would make their own version. So they launched the Ultra Bra, which was pretty much the same thing. Valentine's Day 1994, they both launched their marketing campaigns. Um, and interestingly, everyone thought that the Ultra Bra was going to do better. Well, everyone in the trade press, I read quite a bit about this. They didn't count on the giant billboard posters with Ava Herzegova in her Wonder Bra um, looking down and the big text, Hello Boys, next to it. And all the masses of column inches of people going, cars were crashed, getting distracted by these posters. The technological developments had sort of died off by that point. It was mostly all about marketing, really. Um, so yeah, push-up plunge bras were most of the 1990s. Um, Agent Provocateur started in the 1990s, so sexy underwear became a little bit more um, available, I guess. Um, but then when we get into um, the 21st century, um, it yeah kind of moved on from the push-up plunge bra um, into yeah just those weird molded bras that um, make you look like you've got no nipples whatsoever, and that was all you could buy. It's really weird. Like everywhere, it's just these molded underwired bras. There were there were some interesting developments there. There was another um, another attempt at. Um, creating something that was an alternative to the underwire. Um, and this was a Wonder Bra development, actually. It was their ultimate strapless. Um, the supports look a bit like hands, and they kind of lift you up like that, um, rather than having an underwire shape. Once you, um, you then get into um, the decade that we're currently in, um, things are, um, well, nobody's quite as scared of the nipple anymore, thankfully. So you've got a lot more um, sheer fabrics coming back in. Um, you've got a lot more sort of retro styling and um, loads of non-wired options now. So basically, um, variety is, is what you've got loads of now. Um, and loads more different sizes. I mean, the previous decade, um, size ranges started to expand, but this decade, it's like everyone who can do it is trying, I think. There's one other um, major attempt to try and redevelop the underwire, and that's um, Triumph with their magic wire, um, which isn't a wire, it's made of silicone. Some people do really good developments, but mostly I would say um, be super duper suspicious of anyone who says that they're reinventing the bra, because much like not one person um, invented the bra in the first place, so don't, don't believe anyone that says they know who invented the bra, because there were many, many people who did. No one person came up with it. Um, yeah, anyone that says that they're reinventing the bra, you're probably not. You might have some really good ideas that, that work, but you're not really reinventing it. It's a thing that holds boobs. There's not really much you can do to reinvent that, is there? Um, unless you come up with a thing that makes it super duper comfortable all day forever. In which case, I will concede that you've maybe reinvented the bra, so <laughs> bring it on.